<laughs> January 13th, 1993, 2.9 rating with a 4.2 share, making it the second least watched Clash in history, barely topping Clash 19, which garnered a 2.8. The attendance was 4,000, somewhat papered, I believe, in attendance. Tony Schiavone and Bill Watts welcome us to the Mecca in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, I just said there before, somewhat papered, 4,000. And as we know, as I alluded to it before, and you were right there, you know, every day going up and down the house shows, uh, it was a bad time for wrestling everywhere from WWF, WCW, and Indies were almost non-existent. There was Smoky Mountain, USWA, couples like that barely struggling yep. uh, how sort of bad was w attend uh, wcw attendance on house shows in 1993 at the time yeah really bad uh, you know i understand for the fans out there uh, watching this up uh, we were paid directly off the houses you know so you go into a house and you're a opener or mid-card match and you see 30 percent full yeah you, know, you know that's a shit payoff i mean it's just gonna be and so you know, you start to get into this like malaise feel uh, where, you know, you're going to work, you're not working any less hard than you would before, but maybe you're not taking as many bumps and maybe you know, you're being a little more judicious in the ring, not taking as many chances, which is really the, the, uh, the, the inverse universe of what you should be doing. Right. Uh, if the building's a third full uh, and you want to be half full next time, really work your ass off. But you know, when you're doing this night after night, it's like, how many people go to work and can say, okay, last night, I remember every minute of my eight hour shift. Uh, it's the same thing in wrestling. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a job to us. And as special as it is to go to the ring each night, uh, you know, when you see that the, the, the building empty and, you know, you, you hear it before the show starts and well, people please move to the other side of the arena, you yes. know, cause they're going to, you know, fill up and you're going to, Oh man, like it's going to be a crap week on your paycheck. So, you know, it, it did have a definite effect, even though you were trying not to, uh, you know, and being urged not to, uh, it, it, it just, it just common sense. It does. And so, uh, uh, at this time, the houses were down. And I think this is part of the reason you see, uh, you know, Bill taking chances, right? Like, uh, you know, with a Van Hammer and he's going, to, there were a lot of these new, like there was that temporary time where you weren't allowed to do anything off the top rope. Uh, you know, and once wrestling had gone there, you can't pull it back. You can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. And if you do, then the crowd's going like, oh man. And they are getting a reason to look out because some place, the other place is still doing the stuff off the top rope. Uh, I, I give Bill credit for trying to think of other things to do like that, to, uh, you know, to try to put some legitimacy back into it and everything. But th 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 you know, the nineties, as you're saying, it was across the board. But this is wrestling. You know, if you look back from the from the start of professional wrestling in the earliest days, we would see these huge peaks and then these deep valleys and these huge peaks and these deep. It just would transcend that way. And I think it's just in anything, the natural course of it. When you're hitting these peaks, nobody's trying to think of anything creative because it's a business is great. But when it starts on that downslide, you know, the, the, you're on that roller coaster. It's going to the bottom of the hill anyway. It doesn't matter. You scream. You don't scream. You put your hands up. You don't put your hands up. That that thing's going where it's going. And but at least during this time, they're trying some stuff, and through the course of hit or miss, uh, success and failure, you start to hit on some things, and then you you bottom out, and then you start to ride the next peak. Uh, you know, very very uh, typical. I mean, that's exactly what anybody would do in any business. Uh, try to find that next trend. Sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. And uh, WCW in this time, you know, even prior to like. Uh, you know, I think Eric Bischoff gets uh, from the fans that were our hardcore fans for WCW or NWA. He takes the brunt of, well, okay, this is when they started transitioning towards sports entertainment. And in reality, that had started happening years before. That's why you have a Van Hammer with a guitar and all these different attempts. Turn him heel, turn him back, baby. Bring this one in, bring him out. Uh, there was a, you know, a lot of moving pieces in there at this time. And that really uh, preceded uh, 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 Eric's time in WCW. Eric would take it to a whole different place, but you know that was already going on prior to that. And and you can see in this pay per view as a microcosm, I think a whole whole big chunk. Of, like I said, uh, you know about uh, John B. Bad, you know Mark Marrow. Uh, boy, you watch him come out and the charisma and the poise and everything else. But we know that because of today, looking back, we've watched how many people do that on, you know, these huge shows in WWFE, uh, and, and, you know, and later other companies. Uh, 
just a smidge too early in my estimation, but boy, he, he oozed that. Uh, and, and on this show, you can see a lot of these ups and downs and, and, and we'll talk about those more as we go on to each of the matches. But, uh, that was my takeaway from it. Like, okay, you could tell that the company's it, the, the roller coaster is rolling downhill here. And, and Bill, in, you know, in this case is attempting to throw some, to see whatever sticks. And, you know, some of it did and some of it didn't. You know, Grace of the Hollywood Blondes uh, had a hell of a tag team and me and Ricky. Uh, I think Barry turning heel, uh, you know, would turn to be a bright spot for, for WCW in the future, a little bit down the road from that. So, yeah, but completely typical of what I expected in, in any promotion that's in, in that downhill slot at that point. Uh, I had a look up. It was December 1992. The attendance average for WCW house shows was 930. Ooh, yeah, that sounds so, about right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what like the worst month is, but I mean, that can't be too far from it. Uh, what's, and this is this might be actually be a bigger question than I, than I sort of anticipate, really, but what do you think hastened the decline in popularity in wrestling in the early 90s, according to you? Because I can give a couple of examples. WWF-wise as the market leader. Hulk Hogan is on the outs, pretty much. I mean, he retired, quote-unquote, 1992 WrestleMania. So this is some eight months. Uh, there's also various federal investigations and other accusations as well uh of the two three things i've mentioned there how much credence or percentage of blame essentially for the decline of wrestling do you give them all well they're certainly all, all complicit right but there, but there are others we're now by this time starting to see this wave of deaths that are you know starting to hit in wrestling and for the fans sitting at home, like I can talk about my boys when they were younger and watching wrestling and their eyes would be this big and boy, they're in front of the TV and they loved it. And as they're getting older, they're starting to hear like, wait, my favorite guy died. Well, how'd he die? And you know, there was always a sort of like dour side that was coming beyond these things uh, that because of the dirt sheets and, you know, just social media, you know, on, on its beginning, beginning of its rise, you know, where suddenly we're hearing stories that would have never been heard before. Those would have always been kept kayfabe to behind curtain, uh, but they're leaking out. And I remember like when the David Von Eric story came out, uh, this is like right at the time I'm beginning to break into wrestling. And, you know, I would later hear the full story, but you're like, okay, the guy was what, like 24 and died. And uh, how do you die at 24? And, you know, just like one of the strange, okay, well, maybe he had a, you know, congenital, you know, issue or something, you, you don't know, but, it, but it's there, you know, it's in the back of your head and you hear that and then more, and then there's more, and then there's more. And at the same time, I think there was this push by Vince to a expose the business to save the, you know, on the, uh, on the uh, commission taxes. Cause it, as a, as a show, you don't have to pay the commission tax. Uh, you know, I'd heard the number, don't know how accurate it is, that it was for like 1200 to 1500 bucks per show. So you're going to you know, expose how you cut the lady in half to do this in a business that had always been guarded. Now, we could argue, you know, would later come, but at this time, we don't know that wrestling is going to get to the stratospheric heights that we get in a few years later. Uh you know, so these are all part of it, and you can point the finger to a lot of a lot of us coming in that WCW is pushing, like me included, with Ricky Steamboat. You know, it was really Ricky Steamboat and this kid Shane Douglas with them. You know, you know, we were disparate parts at that point. Uh, Brian and Steve, as phenomenal as they were as a team, they were really both untested. You know, Brian was great on the stick, and and you know, Steve's positioning in the ring was a second to none. But he hadn't yet become Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? So there's this, you know, the, the, again, like I always talk about looking through the contemporary lens. If you snap yourself back into this time frame and look just through that lens and you have no idea the stuff beyond that, you can see where the fans are going, okay, well, like there's less of the guys I love, like Flair and, you know, all these stars that had been the NWA. And now we're seeing this guy, Brian Pillman, and this guy, Steve Austin, and this guy, Shane Douglas, and this guy, Tom Zank, and Tom Brandy, and, you know, all these young bucks coming in. Now, later, we would all prove ourselves in the business, but at that time, we were untested commodities. At the same time, Flair was getting older, Hogan was getting older, and so you've got this convergence, convergence of all these things, this move to sports entertainment that was heresy to wrestling fans. And, but it's being successful. It's pulling younger kids in over here and jettisoning some fans over here. So is the turnover good enough to, to warrant losing those, those fans that are going to be around forever? Um, you know, these are all the big question marks. We're, we're in the infancy still, even though, you know, WrestleMania had started some years prior, but we're still like in the, 
uh, the beginning stages of you know pay per view and how, how what's too much and what's too little. Uh, all these things are going on concurrently, and so there's no way to say, okay, stop. Let's just focus on new characters, or let's just focus on pay per views, or but these things are all going and swirling in the blender at the same time. And so you got to try to figure it out as you're moving along. And I think all of them had some deleterious effect on the business, but also then you could argue set the stage for that next big rise in the business. So again, that peak and valley, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you know this young punk kid Shane Douglas with Ricky Steamboat. Who, okay, I'm, I'm a little familiar with him. Who is he? He hasn't really proven himself. I've not seen him like I've seen Steamboat in classic after classic after classic after classic. And uh, you know Harley Race, another amazing talent. I was a manager, and so it's this sort of transition period in wrestling that we could argue did or didn't contribute to the to the stratosphere it would go into a few years later. Uh, but these things are all swirling at the same time. You know, you said the the pending retirements and unretirements, and uh, you know, iconic names in, iconic names out, new faces in. There's so much going on at this time that I think there's a. I'd be shocked if you look back and say, "Man, the houses were blowing through the roof." But it would in a few years, and I, I I don't think you can just dispel that all of that that was going on right then would settle itself out. You know, it's like when you shake. And you put a big pile of dirt in a sifter and you sift through and you get down smaller and smaller and finally you find the relics. Uh, I think the same thing with wrestling. If wrestling was at a sifter at this point, we're digging through it and finding out who will be those next stars that are going to launch new promotions and and whatever. But at this time, we're still the, the untested kids that hadn't proven anything.